Good morning, and welcome to Medicine Grand Rounds. It's really my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Fergus McKiernan. Um, Dr. McKiernan is a graduate of Reed College in Portland, Oregon, and then received his uh, MD from the University of Minnesota. He undertook his internship and residency at the University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinics, and subsequently took his um, fellowship at the University of Iowa as well. He started out his career in Maine, but in 1987 joined the Marshfield Clinic, where he has remained ever since, serving as director of the Center for Bone Diseases, and currently is the chair of the section of rheumatology for the Marshfield Clinic. He's very well published, listing uh, nine books and chapters and 51 peer-reviewed uh, articles. He's active in many different respects at the Marshfield Clinic, an organization and an institution for which we have great respect here in Madison. Um, being very active there locally, but nationally and internationally, he's active with the International Society for Clinical Dens Densitometry and the American Society of Bone and Mineral Research, serving in uh, national positions for those organizations. He's also the co-founder of the Wisconsin Bone Club, uh, he's received a number of awards over the years, including uh, being listed in the top 10 papers in Bone in 2012. He's been awarded the International Society for Clinical Densitometry Clinician of the Year Award in 2014, and in Marshfield has on numerous occasions been uh, awarded what's called their, their uh, uh, award called the Shining Star, a distinction that is based on the recognition of his patients. Uh, our own rheumatology group was, was tremendously um, impressed having heard you speak before and, and thought it would be a great benefit for us here at the University of Wisconsin to have you join us to give grand rounds. And so please join me in welcoming Dr. McKiernan as he gives grand rounds entitled Recent Controversies in Osteoporosis Management. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. I should say that um, yesterday I retired, so uh, all of those uh, positions are no longer uh, actually true. <laughs> so uh, I want to thank Neil Binkley and Bjorn Buring for uh, getting me out of retirement 24 hours later. <laughs> really, thank you. <laughs> I ran out of things to do yesterday. So uh, I was asked to talk uh, uh, on a couple of controversies in osteoporosis, and um, uh, I hope to finish within the hour and leave a few minutes for, for questions. And I'm going to really focus on, on two things, uh, vertebral augmentation and uh, the drug holiday that uh, we've all heard about. So my real disclosures are on, the, uh, uh, on this slide. And uh, for the front end of this talk, really it's that I believe that vertebral augmentation can relieve fracture pain and improve quality of life provided you have adequate patient selection, technical proficiency, a comp that it's embedded in a comprehensive osteoporosis care program and that you use the appropriate metrics. So for those of you who maybe aren't familiar with, the, the, uh, with augmentation in general, really there are two uh, main things we're talking about, vertebroplasty, which is the percutaneous intravertebral injection of methyl methacrylate or cement, uh, or kyphoplasty, which is essentially a vertebroplasty preceded by the percutaneous inflation of a balloon tamp, the purpose of which was originally uh, uh, meant to be restoration of vertebral height, which has pretty much been shown not to be the case. Uh, subsequently, um, the intention became to create a cavity, but you'll notice that in this vertebrae there's a naturally occurring cavity. So I think this eventually became not to be uh, particularly true either. But um, this has spawned a number of derivatives uh, at other anatomic sites. So we have sacroplasty, odontoplasty, femoroplasty, uh, a number of gadgets, stents, jacks, and implants, new materials. You have to love the orthopedists. And uh, they've really only, these innovations really have only been limited by their imagination and unfortunately in some cases by operator judgment. So I'm just showing you that this field is a, is a little bit like the Wild West. Here's a new paper entitled Percutaneous Vertebroplasty of the Entire Thoracic and Lumbar Vertebrae 
for vertebral compression fractures related to chronic glucocorticoid use. Case report and review of the literature, and the authors concluded that this was a promising addition to the current medical treatments for appropriately selected patients. So that aside, most of us by 2009 who were um, engaged in this field felt that there was a consensus that vertebral augmentation relieved vertebral fracture pain and improved physical function and quality of life in patients with osteoporotic vertebral fractures that had failed comprehensive non-operative therapy, and I distinguish that from conservative therapy, for a sufficient period of time and for whom there were no contraindications. And we debated about restoration of vertebral height, sagittal realignment, improved pulmonary function, reduced fracture-related mortality, and we even discussed the notion of prophylactic augmentation or diagnostic augmentation. And this was largely based on this kind of data and uh, summarized in this meta-analysis of 21 prospective observational studies of a number of patients that pretty much uniformly showed that preoperative pain fell substantially and significantly for both of these procedures and that this was a durable um, a benefit. So what was the controversy? Well, in 2009, you may remember that there were two small trials published. Both were randomized prospective trials with a sham operator comparison for vertebroplasty in women and, and men that had had osteoporotic vertebral fractures. And because of the trial design, this was considered to be evidence-based. And because of where it was published, it was considered to be incontrovertible, such that the authors of this second trial in a subsequent uh, editorial said it, that it would neither be moral or, uh, appropriate or moral to offer vertebroplasty in routine care. So this put a chill on the entire field, and what we consider to be consensus was, was undercut, and actually the very underpinnings of vertebral augmentation became disputed. But it raised, uh, and it had immediate uh, implications for the field, such that within a month, up to date, changed their, uh, uh, their entry about vertebral augmentation, said that we do not, and they underline, not recommend vertebral plastic for patient uh, pain reduction in patients with osteoporotic compression fractures. Immediately after the Blue Cross and Blue Shield uh, Technology Evaluation Committee criteria said that, that they didn't meet their um, criteria for osteoporotic vertebral compression fractures, it took a little while for our orthopedic friends, but a year later they recommended against vertebral augmentation and considered the strength uh, uh, of that evidence to be, of that recommendation to be strong, but they said that kyphoplasty was still an option and the strength of that recommendation they considered to be weak. So the real question was, that, that was raised by these two small trials in which there were fewer than 100 vertebroplasties performed together was that is best trial design in and of itself sufficient? And I'm not going to get into that argument because it's, uh, it, it would take all day. But uh, thankfully, uh, Paul Anderson from the university here, four years later, looked at, uh, pr uh, published a meta-analysis of six prospective randomized controlled trials of vertebroplasty, this included uh, uh, about two-thirds of the patients were vertebroplasty, about a third kyphoplasty, so nearly 900 patients, and more or less showed the same thing with a better trial design. And this, this is simply looking at the visual analog scale for pain, and you can see that there's immediate reduction of pain compared to non-operative therapy, uh, a post-op uh, that endure, is enduring for one week, one month, and for uh, beyond. So he concluded that uh, in this meta-analysis, that there was greater pain relief, greater functional recovery, better health-related quality of life outcomes at 12 weeks and up to 12 months, and that there was strong evidence in favor of augmentation in the treatment of symptomatic fractures. So uh, more recently, these are the trials that are still on uh, clinicaltrials.gov. There are five uh, trials here, uh, four of which have been completed only one of which has actually been published, and that turns out to be the largest single trial of augmentation called the CAVIAR trial. And this was funded by uh, CAIFON. Uh, the CAVIAR stands for Kyphoplasty and Vertebroplasty in the Augmentation and Restoration of Vertebral Function. 
This is a prospective randomized controlled trial, the primary outcome of which, surprising to me, <clears throat> was uh, the, ins uh, the uh, um, percent of subjects with incident fractures at 12 and 24 months. Pain, physical function, restoration of, of vertebral and spinal anatomy was actually a secondary outcome, healthcare utilization, and, se and serious adverse events. And the bottom line was this. <clears throat> um, this is an F SF36. The kyphoplasty uh, arm is in a uh, solid line, the vertebroplasty in the hash line. But no matter what you looked at for clinically relevant um, pain scores, uh, disability, uh, and uh, uh, the outcomes were basically identical. So primary outcomes, secondary outcomes were no difference. And I think we can conclude from this very large trial that um, vertebral Vertebral augmentation, whether it's vertebroplasty or kyphoplasty, relieves fracture pain and improves physical function. And for these particular measured outcomes, there is no difference between those two um, procedures. Okay, so, so what do most of us uh, as internists really need to know? And um, I think from here forward, I'm really going to focus on uh, the, what we need to know is accurate patient selection. And I think this played heavily into the outcome of those two uh, New England Journal trials. So for this uh, segment of the talk, and this will help us for the second uh, part of the talk as well, and recognizing that some of the audience aren't um, osteoporosis or rheumatologist people, uh, I just want to go through a few definitions, uh, so bear with me. So a, a prevalent fracture uh, indicates that, that a vertebral fracture is present at some specified time. You take a picture and there's a fracture. An incident fracture uh, I will use to indicate that a fracture has occurred since a known previous period of time. When I talk about vertebral fracture pain, this is going to be pain that can be largely ascribed to an unhealed fracture, and I'm going to distinguish that from postural fatiguing pain, which is pain largely due to uh, sagittal spinal imbalance. And finally, this concept of dynamic mobility um, refers to an unstable fracture configuration due to complete cortical and cancellous disruption. And if you read this literature that may be referred to as Cummel's disease, the sine qua non of Cummel's disease is air in the vertebrae or a vacuum cleft. So prevalent fractures, you take a picture, this is a VFA taken off a bone density machine. Here is a prevalent fracture. It simply indicates that the fracture is present at a specified period of time. We know from, the, from a number of trials, and this is from the European Vertebral Osteoporosis Study, 16,000 men and women, that uh, prevalent fractures, if you take pictures of populations, will increase over the, the span of life. You may not know that in younger uh, middle age, uh, prevalent fractures are more common in men than in women and are thought jar uh, often to be uh, post-traumatic. Uh, and, and in later stages of life, uh, more common in women, uh, thought to be primarily osteoporotic. Incident fractures indicates a fracture that has occurred since a previous time. So here's a, a triptych of, of uh, a, a woman with a, who presented to the emergency room with back pain. The x-ray was normal. She came back a week later, and you can see if, you're, if you carefully look at the anterior cortex here that it's starting to buckle. This x-ray was also read as normal. And she came back two weeks later uh, with intolerable pain and had, it, had it, her vertebral fracture cemented. Incident fractures are also common in older adults. So in this panel, we look at the 15-year incidence of vertebral fractures from the study of osteoporotic fractures. So this is now mostly postmenopausal, well, it's entirely postmenopausal women. And it's sorted by T-scores. So the, the, these uh, better T-scores are better bone. These are osteoporotic bones. So not surprisingly, the 15-year incidence of vertebral fractures increases uh, as bone density declines. And the two uh, 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 graphs here, uh, this is if there is a prevalent fracture at baseline versus no prevalent fracture. So simply having a fracture at baseline increases the risk of incident fracture over time. It's a powerful predictor of subsequent fracture. Most incident fractures are clinically silent. So this is the fracture intervention trial. This is the pivotal trial from <clears throat> Alendronate or Fosamax. So this started with 6,000 women, and they uh, a prospective trial. So we have good evidence uh, of, of incident morphometric fracture. So those are x-ray fractures. So there were 446 incident fractures in this trial. 
and yet only about a quarter of them were clinically apparent in this prospective trial. And if you sorted this further by a mild fracture or a severe fracture, that's, that's referring to its, the degree of compression. Um, mild fractures were even less clinically diagnosed, but even a severe fracture, um, uh, fewer than a third of these came to clinical attention. So most incident fractures are thought to be clinical, clinically silent. And in older adults, back pain, prevalent back pain is quite common. So this is now again back from the study of osteoporotic fractures. These are women in this trial, age 65 to 70, for whom we had x-rays, so about 3,000 women with x-rays as they entered the trial. Two-thirds of them reported that they, had, that they had had any back pain within the last year. 43% of them reported that this back pain was moderate or severe, and 15% that they had back pain most of the time. So then if you look in this uh, cohort uh, of women who had x-rays and those that had no prevalent fracture by x-ray, the numbers are virtually identical. So whether they had a, a vertebral fracture present on x-ray or not, about two-thirds of women complained of back pain. Almost half reported that back pain to be moderate or severe, and about 15% reported that it was present most of the time. And this back pain can be in it can be moderate or severe. So these are the, this is the subset of those women who reported back pain for whom we had x-rays, and two-thirds of them said that the back pain was present, was moderate or severe, and nearly a quarter present most or all of the time. And again, if you looked at those who had a, a prevalent fracture on their, on their x-ray, the numbers are about equal. Okay, so now turning to... Um, this trial, the fracture prevention trial, this is the pivotal trial of Terry Peritide, and we're looking at the placebo group. So these are very osteoporotic women, many of whom had prevalent fractures, and they're followed prospectively off drug. So incident back pain doesn't necessarily indicate an incident fracture. So in these 110 women, they reported some new or worsening back pain, but the overwhelming majority of them of these osteoporotic women did not have a subsequent fracture. And even if you limited that analysis to those who had severe new or worsening back pain, the majority of them did not have a fracture in this prospective trial. And using the same trial, now if we look in the placebo group, women who actually had a fracture, most of them didn't have back pain. And if you uh, limited that analysis to those who had a morphometrically moderate or severe incident fracture, only half of them in this prospective trial reported back pain. And finally, this is a, an expert rheumatologist uh, who, who looked at 629 postmenopausal osteoporotic women whom he presumed to have a prevalent fracture based on clinical judgment. And while prevalent fractures and the number of fractures correlated with quality of life, social function, and total disability score, there was no correlation with this disease-specific quality of life instrument. So between no fractures and greater than 10 fractures, pain alone was a poor indicator of fracture presence. So I belabored the point to really say that in older adults, prevalent and incident fractures are common but prevalent and incident back pain is also common, and the coexistence of back pain and vertebral fracture is insufficient to, to ascribe causality, and that's important because augmentation only helps fracture pain. So what is vertebral fracture pain? Well, I think uh, my years uh, have led me to believe that you can, you can uh, largely identify fracture pain by its temporal course, by its clinical description, by some physical findings, and by imaging features. So fracture pain <coughs> has a relatively defined onset. And remember that it's incremental. So unlike a hip fracture, a wrist fracture, it's a one and done event. These are incremental so that there's a, there's a fracture initially, the next week it fractures a little bit further, the week after it fractures yet again. So in general, the first month of fracturing is the worst. Most women, and men can say that by the second month they're generally getting better. And on average, I say to my uh, uh, fracturing osteoporotic women that it's about three months before they feel as though they're back to baseline. 
And while fracture duration, pain duration is important, it has actually minimal uh, impact on the outcome of, re of vertebral augmentation. And that's because time is only a surrogate for healing. And it's unhealed fractures that benefit from augmentation, not simply prevalent fractures. Fracture pain is typically axial. So here is um, 504 postmenopausal women. Two thirds of them were complaining of some back pain and buried in that group were uh, about 7% who had a prevalent fracture. The odds ratio for that pain to be re a result of that fracture was quite high for this lateral waist area, good for this lateral thoracic area, but when you start hearing about leg radiation, there's no, uh, it's, there's no specificity for vertebral fracture pain. Remember that fracture pain is wraparound to the abdomen. It can be misdiagnosed as abdominal or visceral pain in about 60% of people, and at least in one or two studies, the majority of people with thoracolumbar fractures reported only iliolumbar pain. Fracture pain uh, intensity is erratic, but it's usually familiar to people who have had fractures. So there are usually, it's marked by surges of halting pain and spasms with gross postural changes. So um, this is why your patients don't go to bed. And you simply ask, are you having difficulty getting in and out of bed? And you'll find that many of them are sleeping in a chair or a recliner for the first six weeks. But it's also marked by some position of reasonable discomfort. So if, so patients say, if you just leave me alone, uh, I'll be fine. As soon as I move, I have these surges of halting pain and spasms. But you might be surprised to know that 16% of them say, I'm best when I'm standing. Not surprisingly, once they're in bed, settled, uh, many of them say, I I'm just fine. If, I, if you stay perfectly still, can you be comfortable? And the answer is usually yes. And if all else fails, Ask the patient who has had a previous fracture, does this remind you of your last fracture? And they'll usually um, give, you the, give you the answer you're looking for. So this is an interesting study, it's relatively recent out of Italy, <coughs> um, that I think um, codifies much of what I'm, I'm trying to say, and that is that there are certain pain-related behaviors on physical examination that if you pay attention to them, uh, they'll be quite rewarding for you. So these are 56 consecutive patients, older adults, that reported thoracolumbar back pain. In that group, there were 20 or so who had an acute fracture, and they were videotaped during six body positions. And then there were blinded raiders who, who watched the videotapes and gave six points to these pain-related behaviors, grimacing, sighing, clenching, blocking eyelids, etc. <coughs> and uh, this is nicely outlined in this video clip here. Uh, and if you listen to this uh, fellow with, a, with an acute fracture, the picture, I think, says a thousand words. Whoops, so how do we? Okay, it's not feeling bad now. How bad was that pain coming up? Eight, nine. But by the end of it, he's smiling. And so it's that transition. If, if your patients aren't showing you that in your physical examination, don't send them to vertebral augmentation or at least hesitate and think about, is this going to help this patient? As it turns out, those pain behaviors have a high uh, predictive value uh, for fracture pain uh, and for dynamic mobility and this thing that we'll uh, show you in just a moment, the intervertebral cleft. Surprisingly, focal tenderness is common uh, in women with prevalent uh, and incident vertebral fractures, but it's an unreliable predictor of fracture level or of outcome. And fracture pain must be distinguished from what I call po uh, post-fracture postural fatiguing pain. So patients are no longer reporting these surges of pain like this gentleman had getting in and out of bed. Are you still, uh, are you still sleeping in the recliner? No, I'm back in bed. That tells you he's tran this patient's transition from acute fracture pain to this postural fatiguing pain. And this pain gradually begins to dominate as the fracture heals and patients start to resume their usual daily activities. They describe it as a crescendo, burning, fatiguing, exhausting pain. And they say, look, I, uh, I just can't do my counter work. After five or 10 minutes, I gotta go sit down. <clears throat> so what, what is the mechanism for this uh, postural fatiguing pain? I believe it's sagittal imbalance. So you can see in this state of good health, um, our center of gravity is nicely balanced with, uh, with the uh, normal uh, curve of the spine. But, but as the center of gravity gradually shifts forward with, no, with increasing numbers of fractures, you have to have a counterbalance. Oops. You have to have
to have a counterbalance, uh, otherwise you'd fall on your face. And that's provided by all of these small paraspinous muscles, which are just overwhelmed by the, by the task of holding you upright. And it's leveraged off your low back. So many people who never had back pain but have existing uh, uh, disc disease start to complain of more typical disc disease post-fracture. So this is largely, this post-fracture uh, postural fatiguing pain is largely due to a sagittal imbalance. You must distinguish it from vertebral fracture pain. You must distinguish it from pre-existing back pain generators and generators that have been made worse by the acquired postural deformity because augmentation only helps vertebral fracture pain. So you can get increasing confidence that back pain is fracture in, orig in origin um, from your radiograph by changing configuration or dynamic mobility. I'll show that in a moment. From your bone scan by intense linear radionuclide uptake from MR with bone marrow edema. And you should be, you should be careful if, you, if these uh, imaging uh, doesn't support your contention that this is vertebral fracture pain uh, and reconsider. So here's something to remind you that vertebral fracture configuration changes over time. Here's that anterior cortical buckling one week later. But it also changes with axial loading. So this is a remarkable x-ray of a patient standing where there's a wisp of bone and 30 seconds later laying down. And this is what we call dynamic mobility. It's simply complete cortical and cancellous disruption of the vertebrae. This is why they have these halting spasms of pain getting in and out of bed because their bone is actually doing this. This is referred to as Cummel's disease in the literature. The sine qua non is the intervertebral cleft. Uh, and for this very reason, if you have a patient with a vertebral fracture, don't send them down for a routine lateral, uh, AP and lateral radiograph of their spine because you're going to make them get on and off a hard table. You're going to make them go through this, and you may miss this fracture because when they lay down, it may look like this. So just get a single standing lateral. They don't have to get on and off the table. It's more compassionate, and it's more likely with this axial loading to show minor changes in cortical margins. Bone scans show these intense linear uh, bands, but recall that a bone scan will remain positive for up to a year in 40% of patients and maybe even three years in a very small minority. Remember that bone scans can be negative if you, if you scan too early because you have to mount a reparative response, so give it three to five days. If you have a massive cleft like I just showed you, that bone is dead. It's not going to accumulate any radionuclide. Adynamic ro uh, renal bone disease, lytic mets. And if you've treated your patient with bisphosphonates like zolendronate within the last uh, uh, week or two, uh, you may have... Uh, you may generate a falsely negative scan. So those are some pitfalls. MRI uh, will show a low signal on T1, a high signal on STIR. It's very helpful at discriminating recent from healed fractures. These are healed fractures. It's best done immediately prior to procedure because uh, uh, you may find uh, un, uh, fractures you weren't aware of. And, but remember that the signal may remain uh, positive for up to, be, up to a year. PET scans may be positive in the first month. It's re reassuring when it's negative or when the SUV, the standard uptake value, is less than three. And then you have this sticky question about, well, when is fracture pain severe enough? When, should I, when is it bad enough that I should bring my patient to uh, an augmentation? And that's, um, that's a clinical judgment. Um, you have to look at the absolute magnitude of pain, the healing trajectory. Are they on course for healing in, in uh, two or three months? Look at the consequences of your treatment and of the fracture itself. Look at their resilience, and think about the social consequences. So if your patient is a care provider for a demented husband, and you are now uh, going to subject this woman to a nursing home or to narcotics, you really are taking two people down, not just one. And that may factor into your decision about when is it uh, severe enough to consider an augmentation. So this is, uh, just to finish up, um, this is a study from, uh, from the, uh, the kyphoplasty trials just to show you the difference between operative and non-operative, uh, and, and no matter what realm you look at, uh, uh, there is benefit. And, and I would look at this, the, the integrated sum of, these, of the difference between these curves represents the disutility of non-operative care. So there are a number of costs that you need to think about um, and why uh, I would be cautious to call uh, non-operative care conservative because there are occasions where maybe the most conservative thing to do is to consider an augmentation event early. So with that background, uh, the 2015 indications, well, uh, Blue Cross and Blue Shield really haven't changed their position much, but you might argue that they have a, um, 
uh, a conflict of interest since they fund these things. Uh, our friends, the orthopedic surgeons, haven't changed their tune, but it might be because the evidence is buried in the medical literature. I don't know. Um, but up to date has said that while kyphoplasty is performed more frequently, they now say vertebroplasty may be, be the preferred procedure because it's not bipedicular, it's less expensive, but the key is that patient selection is a critical factor. So these are the contraindications. We would never perform this if there is an undercorrected coagulopathy, a local bone or systemic infection. They weren't healthy enough to undergo general anesthetic. The vertebral anatomy was unsafe. The posterior cortical wall was, uh, was disrupted. And I certainly wouldn't do this where there was insufficient surgical backup because if something goes wrong, uh, you, need to, you need to address it uh, immediately. These are uh, some of my own uh, feelings about uh, contraindications. I really resist doing this in young people. Um, there's a lot of to do about the uh, vertebral degree of vertebral compression fra uh, fracture, but, but it's, most of this literature doesn't recognize the vertebral property of dynamic mobility. Uh, so many people who had a vertebral plana can actually be cemented if you look for that property. Um, people who are habitually falling, I think it's a bad idea to put cement in, in, in their spine uh, because of the effect on the, on the adjacent vertebrae. So uh, down on the home stretch here, um, a prevalent vertebral fracture is likely causing pain when it's a relatively recent in onset. There's concordant axial pain. Uh, it may radiate to the posterior superior iliac crest or maybe wrap around. Ask them, can you get in and out of bed? If the vertebral configuration is changing over time or with axial loading, uh, that's likely a pain generator. Uh, if there's evidence of acute injury by bone scan or MR, oh, that supports your contention that the, that the patient's pain is fracture in origin. I'd be cautious if there's an ambiguous uh, onset or prolonged duration of pain. Um, if symptoms are morphing from vertebral fracture to postural fatiguing pain, be cautious because it will not help this. This, this is just the getting in and out of bed uh, test. If the vertebral uh, configuration is stable, there's no longer dynamic mobility of the bone. Even if the bone scan and the MR is still hot, I'd be careful. Um, and it's unlikely that your patient has vertebral fracture pain if it's been a long duration. These are non-axial symptoms. They can get it in and out of bed easily or on and off your exam table easily if the bone is increasingly sclerotic and you have a negative imaging studies. And I'd be aware uh, if there are uh, strong suggestions of other uh, causes, notably infection uh, or cancer. Okay, so the second part of my talk, um, pack this in pretty tight here, is this drug holiday notion. Um, that's becoming increasingly uh, important. So this discussion, uh, I think you probably know, largely or really exclusively refers to bisphosphonates and particularly the nitrogen-containing bisphosphonates. So it's not teriparatide, it's not denosumab, it's not uh, selective estrogen receptor modulators. Okay? So um, bisphosphonates are analogs of pyrophosphate, a naturally occurring modulator of bone metabolism in which there's a carbon for oxygen substitution that renders that molecule resistant to hydrolysis and therefore biologically stable. Bisphosphonates bind to bone through this bone hook and the uh, avidity or the affinity uh, uh, of that varies among bisphosphonates, is weakest in residronate and is uh, stronger in alendronate and zolendronate, statistically stronger. And bisphosphonates work by inhibiting this key uh, um, enzyme in the mevalonic pathway, farnesyl uh, pyrophosphate synthase. And the degree that it inhibits that um, enzyme is dependent on the, the R2 group, so that lendronate is actually the weakest and zolendronate and residronate stronger. Okay, so all of this is to say that Bisphosphonates have a long residence time in bone. They bind to hydroxyapatite where they are potent inhibitors of osteoclast function. They are non-hydrolyzable. They are partially resorbed during subsequent remodeling cycles and are excreted very slowly. So that it's at least biologically plausible that prolonged bisphosphonate retention in bone could result in sustained biologic and therapeutic effect long after the drug's been discontinued. And if you read the package insert for uh, alendronate or Fosamax, it states that the terminal half-life in, in humans is estimated to exceed 10 years, probably reflecting release of alendronate from the skeleton. 
Based on the above, it's estimated that after 10 years of oral treatment with Fosamax, the amount of alendronate released daily from the skeleton is approximately 25% of that absorbed from the GI tract. So how does this relate to patient care, and in particular in terms of bone mineral density and bone turnover markers? Well, this is a curve that is probably familiar to you, and it will become increasingly familiar through the remainder of the talk. This is from the fracture intervention trial. This is the pivotal alendronate trial. It looks at the response of the lumbar spine to bone mineral density to five years of oral alendronate. So most of the bone density benefit comes in the first few years, and in years four and five, it starts to level off. So the cur curves I'm about to show you are what happens if you take alendronate for, or, or risidronate in, in, in some instance, for six months and stop, for one year and stop, for two years and stop, and for three years and, and stop. And you can get the, no the sense that over time, the longer you take a drug and then stop, the slower is the offset in terms of a bone mineral density uh, measurement. If you look at bone turnover markers after stopping bisphosphonates of varying durations, again, here's the data from the FIT trial. So this is drug for, for five continuous years. There is immediate and marked suppression of n telopeptides, and it's sustained over the course of five years. If you take drug for, for six months and stop, bone, bone, bone turnover markers rapidly have a rapid offset. One year, two years, three years, you get the sense once again that the longer you're on the drug, the slower the offset in terms of bone turnover markers as measured by urine and telopeptides. So the first trial to look at long-term extension of alendronate was this phase three trial of alendronate. They had, a, they had some quirky um, dosing, but, but these are relatively equ equivalent doses for five and 10 years that I'll show you. So here's bone mineral density, here's 10 years. This is the response for, for alendronate for 10 years at the lumbar spine. Again, most of the benefit coming in the first several years. And here's the, here's the bone density response to alendronate for 10 years. Now, if you give alendronate for five years and stop, here's the response in this trial uh, at the spine and the response at the hip. So that at 10 years, whether you took the drug completely, uh, continuously for 10 years or stopped after five years, bone density at year 10 was roughly similar. And if you look at the response to bone turnover markers, 10 versus five years, this is the 10-year data, continuous treatment with five milligrams of alendronate, 10 years, urine to antilopeptide, versus if you stop at five years. There's really a small rise in bone turnover markers. It doesn't go anywhere close to baseline and is steady out to year 10. So what are the primary sources for long-term benefit? Uh, well, they come from two trials, and it's important that we understand the construct of these trials when you interpret this data. So these are the pivotal bisphosphonate extension trials. This is uh, alendronate and zolendronate. So the FIT trial, the fracture intervention trial, was the pivotal um, trial for registration of alendronate or Fosamax. The FLEX is the FIT long-term extension of that trial from years five through 10. These were varying doses of oral alendronate, but they were daily doses. Most of us don't use daily doses. The original trial was a three-year fracture uh, outcome, bone density and bone turnover outcome, and the extension trials went from year five to year 10. So that's what we refer to as FLEX. The horizon trials were the health outcomes and reduced incidence with zoledronic acid once yearly. This is uh, um, reclassed. So it was five milligrams yearly intravenous dose of, of reclass. They were originally a, a three-year trial, and then they extended those trials to years six and nine. So here's um, uh, the FLEX trial. They, they enrolled patients that had uh, about five years of, of drug to either placebo for five years or daily oral alendronate for five years. So what we learned from these trials are fracture incidents at five and 10 years. The horizon trials at three years randomized to um, placebo at three years, so that's Z3, zoledronic acid for three years, placebo for three years, and then stopped, or continuous treatment for six years, or Z6. And then they re-randomized this smaller group to three years of placebo or a total of nine years. And this data was just published this, uh, this year. So from these trials, we have so slightly different time points. Rather than five and 10 years, we have three, six, and nine. So this is starting to look very familiar. This is the FLEX trial data. This is the results at the, uh, of continuous treatment with alendronate for 10 years at the spine, 
and at the hip. And if you stop at five years, in fact, there is a statistically significant reduction in bone mineral density at year 10, but it does not go back to baseline. If we look at the bone turnover markers, this is the curve I showed you previously for the phase three trial. The flex data looks very similar. And if you stop at five years, there's no difference. They stopped reporting this outcome at eight years for reasons that aren't clear to me, but I suspect that it's because they were finding no difference. The horizon data, so here is <coughs> zoledronic acid at three years of continuous therapy, six years of continuous therapy, and nine years of continuous therapy. The curves are starting to look very familiar. There's no data here at this point. They, uh, but if you stop treatment at three years and, and, and stay on placebo, at year six, there's no statistical difference in, in bone mineral density at the spine. We don't know the data uh, out at year nine. At the hip, there is a slightly uh, re reduced um, hip BMD at year six, but not at year nine. Turnover markers, here's continuous therapy with zoledronic acid for nine years. You stop the drug at, at three years. Three years later, there's no difference in bone turnover markers off therapy. And at year nine, if you stop at year six, there's no difference. So there is an enduring effect in these trials for bone density and bone turnover markers. And there are similar results for bone markers or formation at year six and year nine. Okay, but this is all well and good. Bone turnover markers and bone density are only surrogates for what we really care about, which is fracture. So what happens to fracture benefit? And here we see a prevalent fracture, but now we have to distinguish between a morphometric fracture and a clinical fracture. So in the osteoporosis literature, morphometric fractures are either a prevalent or incident fracture without having knowledge of clinical symptoms. So it's just there. We don't know whether this is symptomatic or not. In all of these trials, clinical fractures were, were incident uh, fractures that were ascribed pain. And uh, I am pretty confident that, that in none of these trials were the, was, was fracture pain, as I've defined it, really adjudicated. The important thing to know is that the morphometric fracture is the primary outcome measure from almost every osteoporotic drug trial. It's the, go, it's the standard. Remember that only a third uh, or a quarter of morphometric fractures are thought to be clinical. And in these trials, these were reported as uh, self-reported and recorded as adverse events. So I'm really skeptical about this clinical trial business, uh, clinical fracture uh, business in the trials. Okay, so we all know that these are good drugs. Here's the FIT trial. The fracture incidence at three-year morphometric fractures, highly significant, about a 50% reduction of morphometric fractures, 50% reduction of clinical fractures, 50% reduction of hip fractures, and about a 30 to 35% reduction in all clinical fractures using alendronate at three years. Uh, with the, ex the early extension, we, we see the same data. Highly significant, about a 50% reduction uh, in fractures with alendronate. Very similar with um, zolendronate. 70% reduction in morphometric fractures at three years. Um, high, highly significant reduction in clinical fractures, hip fractures, and all clinical fractures with <coughs> zoledronic acid at three years. And beyond that, there may even be some mortality benefit. In, the, in one of the uh, permutations of the Horizon trial, there was a survival benefit in, in, in men and women post-hip fracture that were treated with this drug. But what about in the extension period? This is what we care about, fractures in the extension period. Well, in the FLEX trial, <coughs> based on 16 fractures out of an original enrollment of 6,000, there was a statistically significant reduction in clinical fractures by continuing drug therapy to year 10 versus stopping at year 5. But there was no benefit in morphometric fractures, the usual measure uh, in most osteoporotic trials. There was no benefit in hip fracture, and there was no benefit in any clinical fracture. This differed from the Horizon trial, uh, where at year 3, uh, clinical fractures were, were definitely reduced. They were not reduced, unlike the FIT tr FLEX trial, they were not reduced at year six or year nine. In fact, there was a non-statistically significant signal for harm in year six. Morphometric fractures was a different story. In the, in the zoledronic acid trials, there was um, a still persisting 50% reduction in morphometric fractures by extending zoledronate to, to year six, but not at year nine. For, all, for hip fracture, no benefit at year six or year nine. 
for all or any clinical fracture, no benefit at year six or year nine. And this graph is going to be complicated, but I think the point, the, what I want to, to just show you is, is the visual of where the, the data just starts, to, starts to degrade. So the blue color, uh, the color uh, correlates with the trial, so blue is horizon. The shape correlates with morphometric fracture, which is the usual currency of, of osteoporosis trials. Any clinical fracture, because that's clinically relevant. Hip pressure, because that's the big deal. And the size of the object relates to how many patients are left in the trial. So the bigger and bolder, uh, the more convincing. Um, the hashed means that they are no longer significant. So here's, here's the morphometric fracture data from Horizon. Here's the any clinical fracture. Here's the hip fracture. And I'm just going to scroll through these and start putting these up and create a visual here that um, by about year five or six, we start to have data that is either so degraded or it's not, not statistically significant or even maybe suggests harm uh, that, uh, that I think about year five, so that was the starting point for the FLEX trial, in year six, the Horizon trial, uh, the data becomes very unconvincing. But these authors took this data from the 10-year FLEX trial and tried to slice and dice it in a way to, to salvage some, some meaning. And this is what you will read in the literature. So this paper takes the um, FLEX data at year 10 and looks at non-vertebral fracture risk, divides the, the, the pile between people with better T-scores or osteoporotic T-scores, and whether they had a vertebral fracture absent or present at the beginning of the trial. And you can see that for all of these various subcategories, there was not only no significant benefit, but in these categories, there was a non-significant trend towards harm. But they did salvage this one small group here. If you had a T-score of more negative than minus 2.5 at year 5, and you had no fracture, at year 10, you had benefit in the non-vertebral fracture risk of about 50%. Overall, this represented 3.4% of the original total population. And the most highly osteoporotic people, those with low T-scores and a prevalent fracture, had no benefit. What the article stated was that continuing alendronate for 10 years instead of stopping after five reduces non-vertebral fracture risk in women without a prevalent fracture whose femoral neck T-score achieved after five years was less than 2.5, but does not reduce risk of non-vertebral fracture in women who have better T-scores, and for that matter, anyone who had a prevalent fracture. There was no benefit. So what's the controversy? Well, the controversy is this. One expert said <coughs> in the New England Journal that the use of alendronate for 10 years as compared with five years was associated with significantly fewer new vertebral fractures and non-vertebral fractures in patients with a bone mineral density of T-score of minus 2.5 or below. While not untruthful, it's not actually correct. In the, in the uh, JCEM, uh, another expert said a subsequent analysis indicated that among subjects with low T-scores, non-vertebral fracture was reduced by 50%. Well, partly true, but that's only if you didn't have a vertebral, a vertebral fracture at study entry. And now up to date says, for patients who have taken bisphosphonates for five years and are at high risk for fracture, well, presumably that would be somebody with a low T-score, and a prevalent vertebral fracture who didn't benefit, and they state previous fracture, older age, frail, high risk, et cetera, we suggest continuing therapy. That's the controversy. But it heats up this month because just this month, uh, an expert panel from a venerated group, the ASBMR, the task, uh, they, they, they put together a task force to, uh, regarding managing osteoporosis in patients on long-term bisphosphonates and concluded that in women at high risk, older age, low hip T-scores, high frac scores, previous fracture, continuation of treatment for up to 10 years oral or six years IV should be considered. And, and this will be, I think, trickle down to general practice and become the standard if it stands. In their article, they balance this against the risk for atypical femur fractures. Hopefully you're familiar with these or heard about them. And they reference Dell's data out of the Kaiser Permanente that shows that the year, against years of exposure to bisphosphonates, these atypical fractures rise substantially after about year five. These are important numbers. 
because in their paper they're going to quote a, 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 an absolute risk of 16 per 100,000 patients, atypical fractures at year 5, and 113 at year 10. More recent data out of Sweden suggests actually that number might be a gross underestimate and that at year 5 it, it actually should be 110, but they use this number. And they put this graph up here to provide a perspective of safety concerns for those of you who are doubters. So um, this is incidence per 100,000. They want to make you feel comfortable that, you know, uh, these are common events, motor vehicle events, but fractures are way more common. Homicides are, nobody is going to get killed, so we're not going to worry about these low numbers. And, and they calculate based on a conservative 35% reduction in all fractures that at five years of bisphosphonate therapy, you will save 2590 fractures, that includes hip, spine, wrist, you will cause 16 atypicals, no osteonecrosis of the jaw, and you'll have a favorable risk-benefit ratio of 162 fractures prevented for one case of an atypical fracture. I'll leave it to you to decide if that's fair. But isn't the real issue the risk at 10 years? That's the extension trial. And we have pretty good data about the atypical fracture risk at 10 years, but the task force demurred on the 10-year fracture benefit of bisphosphonate, stating that for years five through 10 of bisphosphonate therapy, there are insufficient data to estimate the number of fractures averted by bisphosphonates because the only studies available were unpowered for fracture endpoints. What? The only studies available were unpowered for fracture endpoints? Didn't they say that in women at high risk, you should continue drug therapy for, for 10 years? Well, if we go back and use their same chart, so now we're just focusing on the vertebral fractures, if we only look at vertebral fracture at 10 years, there are 1,400, and you assume that there's a relative risk of point, uh, actually I've overestimated this, it should be 0.65, sorry, um, that you saved 1,470 fractures. Now at 10 years we know that there's 113 atypicals and 26 ONJs. This, this risk benefit ratio doesn't look very good to me. 10 vertebral fractures prevented for one case of ONJ or an atypical fracture. And if you do the same exercise with hip fractures, of course the numbers are much smaller, you save 175 hip fractures, cause 113 atypicals and 26 ONJ. Now the risk benefit looks to me like 1.26 hip fractures prevented for one case of ONJ uh, and atypicals caused. And if you don't use their data from the Kaiser Permanente, but look at the, what the American Academy of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgeons estimate to be the ONJ risk at 10, in years 5 through 10 at 210, an order of magnitude greater, and look at some very small but careful case, prospective case series of, of atypicals that it might be as high as 2 or 3 percent percent after five years, uh, these adverse outcomes totally eclipse benefit, in my opinion, uh, extending therapy beyond 5 to 10 years. This is an interesting paper I just thought I'd show you. We just published this year. Um, this looks at the number of prescriptions of bisphosphonates from 1996. This is when alendronate was uh, um, approved, 1995, up to the, the end point of the study. You can see there was a great rise and a plateau, and now in the last five years, a big fall. And they correlated that with Google search activity for the word Fosamax. And there was a spike here for the first lawsuit of Fosamax. This is when the um, publication in, in the uh, medical journal about AFib and Fosamax. This was an hour-long uh, ABC World News uh, expose uh, on, bisphos on atypical fractures. And now they've added this following curve. This is the incidence of subtrochanteric and diaphyseal fractures. This is not only atypical fractures, but it, it should include atypicals. And you can see that there's a parallel rise with atypicals with a parallel increase in prescriptions. And for the first time this last year, we're seeing a downturn in atypical fractures, and that's been true in my clinical practice, and I think other experts have, have said that as well. So what about bisphosphonate holidays? Bisphosphonates are highly effective at reducing vertebral hip and non-vertebral fractures in three to five years, and they should be reserved for patients at high risk for fracture. I consider a holiday in most patients after five years when there's been a high degree of adherence and compliance, they've achieved their expected bone, dens bone density benefits. We see suppression of bone turnover markers because there is evidence of persisting biologic effect of bisphosphonates. There's a persisting anti-fracture benefit after stopping bisphosphonates. And there's insufficient evidence, in my opinion, to continue bisphosphonates um, 
for greater uh, additional fracture benefit. And additional treatment entails cost, dosing, administrative burdens, and concern for these outcomes and some potential owners. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. We have time for just one or two quick questions and quick answers. And I'll ask you to repeat the question. Okay. Yes. So the question relates to the timing of vertebral augmentation. Why would you wait for weeks and months allowing this disutility of non-operative care rather than just get in at day one? Uh, I'm sympathetic to that notion, um, but the, uh, the two trials in the New England Journal absolutely put a chill on the entire field. And, and if you look at the number of vertebroplasties performed before and after the, that paper, it's remarkable. Uh, Absolutely, yeah. You're, yes, you're preaching to the choir. So, so I think that the key here is make sure that this person has vertebral fracture pain. It doesn't. It sounds. It sounds self-evident, but it's not. Number one. Number two is look at more than just pain. Look at the context, uh, uh, the social context, the medical context. But I am totally sympathetic that there is. I think you can make a strong argument not based on uh, peer review literature, but, but on common sense, that there are some instances, particularly a high-risk fracture, I would say a thoracolumbar fracture, where, where those are destined to, to, to be difficult to heal. So a T12-L1 fracture, day one, if they've already got, they fell this morning, they've already got 20% height reduction, that's going to have a bad outcome. I, I would make the argument, if you have the capacity, uh, cement that person today, get them embedded in an osteoporosis program and you'll have a better outcome. I can't prove that or back it up with, with, uh, with data. Yeah. We're going to have to close there. I'm sorry. I want to th thank Dr. McKiernan for an outstanding grand round. So welcome. I'm, I'm happy to stay around if people want to ask questions. Yeah, people want to come up, though. Really appreciate it. Thanks. <laughs>